So that's the blend line. That's what our regulations say is the maximum amount of ethanol that you can use in our gasoline supply. Okay, so that's one part of our legal system. Here's the other part. That's the ethanol mandate in the RFS standards. And you can see the blue bar creeping up to the red bar. And in 2013, the RFS mandate was 800 million gallons above the E10 blood wall and continuing to increase until the point where that renewable gap reaches probably 2 billion gallons by 2015. So this, more than anything else, <laughs> explains the controversies that have swirled around the RFS in the last year or two. What Daryl and I have, liked, have called the collision between the market realities of ethanol and the RFS standards. This is kind of a goofy looking demand curve, but we think uh, it's very useful in understanding the economics of the ethanol market. And so it's a, this is the market for ethanol, assuming no mandate, price on the vertical axis, quantity here on the horizontal axis. And we have this funny looking kinked demand curve for ethanol. Let me explain it. Uh, briefly. This segment right here, the perfectly vertical segment, reflects a minimum demand for ethanol of, assumed to be 5 billion gallons as a replacement for MTBE, which is an oxygenate that we use to address pollution problems in high small metro areas. And there basically isn't in the short run any uh, economical alternative to ethanol for that oxygenate. So if every incentive the government offers for ethanol in the, in the U.S. disappeared tomorrow, the ethanol market would be a minimum of 5 billion gallons. And it's price insensitive. That's what that reflects. Price change, you still use 5 billion gallons. The next part, which requires a little more explanation, is this flat segment, or perfectly elastic segment. Uh, that is the, what we call the break-even selling price for a gasoline blender for ethanol. And if you look at that, that'll be a little surprising to some of you. It's equal to 1.1 times the price of wholesale gasoline. That's what CBOB represents. It's basically wholesale gasoline. It's the wholesale gasoline feedstock. And so we're saying that the value of ethanol to a blender is 110% of the wholesale price of gasoline. Where does that come from? It's because gasoline refiners and blenders in the U.S. have discovered in the last five years or so that ethanol is a cheap, sort, relatively cheap source of octane for gasoline mixtures. And the entire system has been re-optimized to take advantage of the wide-scale availability of uh, ethanol in that regard. Uh, and so that's what we're basically saying is gasoline refiners will include ethanol up to 10% in the blends up to a price of ethanol equal to 110% of the wholesale price of gasoline. That's the break even. And then we hit the blend wall right here. That reflects the technical limit, regardless of the price of ethanol, uh, of the 10% blend wall. So that gives you overall then this kind of strange looking kinked demand curve. And a standard supply curve gives you an equilibrium price that for a wide range of ethanol prices is 13 billion gallons. This simple model has a actually very profound implication with regard to policy. I just had a reporter ask me this yesterday. If uh, some of the recently uh, proposed legislation to uh, delete the ethanol mandate from the RFS, well, how devastating would that be to the U.S. ethanol industry if that actually happened? This model and analysis predicts basically no change. Blenders 
at least in the short run, are making uh, some fairly healthy margins blending ethanol into the gasoline supply, and there would be no rational reason to give that up in the short run. So that's a little bit of an antidote to some of the hysteria that's going around about the 2014 rules that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. The basic economic position of ethanol in our gasoline mixtures is pretty strong, up to 10%. So I wouldn't anticipate much change if the RFS went away tomorrow. Okay, but that's kind of a sidebar. Now we want to use this model to walk through what happens as the RFS mandate is ratcheted up over time. So in 2011, it was 12.6 billion gallons, then 13.2, not equal to the blend wall in 2012, and then in 2013, as we already know, it went up to 13.8 uh, billion gallons with that 800 million gallon renewable gap. If there were no safety valves built in to the RFS, this would be an infeasible policy. There would be no way for obligated parties, think energy companies in the US, to meet the mandates because you could only squeeze in 13 billion gallons into the gasoline supply in this simple framework without higher blends. And it would just blow apart. There would be, they would, you would literally just have to pay the fine for those 800 million gallons. But there are safety valves built into the legislation. Remember what I talked about earlier that an advanced biofuel can meet the renewable, and in particular, you would want an advanced biofuel that's not subject to the E10 blend wall. What might that be? I heard it, biodiesel. In effect, what happens in this scenario is that that renewable gap effectively becomes additional biodiesel mandate. And this has profound implications for the pricing of the RIN credits that are used to comply with the RFS. So I'm going to show you a chart that I think basically uh, confirms this conceptual analysis. How many people have heard of RINs? Raise your hand. Tell me if you're awake. All right, you're with me. Okay, the, what the EPA created, think of a RIN as if you blend a gallon of ethanol into the gasoline supply and your BP, you get a piece of paper that says, okay, I can prove that I blended that, I'm gonna turn that piece of paper in and it's called a RIN. Well, they made, when they set the program up, they made those RIN credits negotiable, so there's a secondary market, and the price of those RINs should represent what you're willing to pay as an obligated party under the RFS for not blending. In other words, I could blend the stuff myself, or I could just buy somebody else's excess credit. Well, the economics are such that you wouldn't pay more than what you could actually uh, experience as a loss for blending yourself. Okay, so that's the basics of how RINs pricing works. Well, something really remarkable happened in early 2013. Let's focus first on the lower red line. That is the market price of those RIN credits for compliance with the ethanol or renewable mandate. If you're making money blending ethanol, how much would you be willing to pay for somebody else's uh, paper for blending? Theoretically, zero, right? If I'm making money, I want to make the money. I don't want to buy your credit. That would be just taking away from my profit. And gee, that's kind of interesting. What they sell for? Pretty close to next to nothing for most of the life of the RFS in and of itself, evidence of positive blending profits for using ethanol, most of the time. 
Now, contrast that with the blue line, which is biodiesel. Wow. People are willing to pay a lot to avoid blending biodiesel, aren't they? Up to $2 a gallon and typically a dollar a gallon. And that's its own issue is why is biodiesel blending so unprofitable compared to the profitability of ethanol blending? But I don't have time to go there. Maybe in the question we can explore that. Um, but here's, thinking back to the previous slide, Think of how this works. Right up to December 31st, 2012, a D6 REN for ethanol would reflect the fact that you're making money and you're below the blend wall. But the day the calendar clicks over to January 1st, 2013, at the margin, the D6 REN is worth what? A D4 biodiesel REN. That's the prediction of this model. What happened? If you want to understand what appears to be the crazy pricing of RINs in 2013, this is exactly, it worked exactly like the features of the program uh, would predict once you understand the interaction of the standards with the blood wall. And they have basically immediately, like a magnet, went up to the biodiesel RIN price and pretty much tracked there all year. <coughs> So another interesting implication of this analysis is, is there's a lot of headlines, a lot of, there's congressional committees investigating the RENS market. They're supposedly manipulated. Prices can't make sense when they're going up like the D6 RENS price did in 2013. And my argument is they're behaving exactly as basic economics would predict. So, but this is now, the background you need to understand the very controversial 2014 rules that the EPA proposed in mid-November and were actually leaked earlier in uh, September. Because many people argued that the rise of the D6 RIMS price was the canary in the coal mine signaling that the E10 blend wall collision with the mandates allowed was a signal that implementation of the standards was going to cost consumers a lot more money. That you could take 10% times the RIN and that would tell you how much the RFS was adding to the price of a gallon of gasoline at the pump. Now, whether that's really true or not is another argument, but that is what has driven the policy debate in D.C. 